I'm delighted to introduce Scott Lidler and Dan Stein from Lake Flato Architects in a fireside chat about how to leverage synergies at the intersection of sustainability design technology and IT. Scott is Lake Flato's Director of Operations. He brings strong leadership and oversight to human resources, finance, management, and business operations. He ensures that internal processes maximize the firm's capabilities and growth capacity. He's committed to establishing an outstanding business culture supported by a sound financial and operational model to produce design of the highest quality. Scott has an MARC and MBA. He has a diverse background as an architect in both small firms and the world's largest multinational engineering company, ACOM, and launched and sold a startup in the television broadcast industry. All this informs a sophisticated approach to organizational design and operations. Dan Stein is Lake Flato's Director of Design Technology. He has over 20 years of experience. He's, recognize, he's a recognized global leader who has helped architecture firms around the world manage design technology and implement BIM-based workflows, including daylighting analysis, early energy modeling, virtual reality, augmented reality. Industry technology designers and vendors also look to Dan for thought leadership and advice. Uh, including his work to create the electrical productivity pack for Revit and the CTC software and on-site software beta testing with Autodesk's Shanghai China office. Dan has written 14 textbooks, uh, serves as chair of the IES BIM Standards Committee, and maintains a popular blog, BIM Chapter. So please join me in welcoming Scott Liller and Dan Stein. Thank you. Thank you. So both of you have developed your careers as an extension of working as an architect. Uh, I'd love if you could walk us through a little bit of your career journey so far. Well, first of all, I got to remind Dan that he continually impresses everybody with how much he's actually able to accomplish while holding down a pretty challenging full-time job at the same time. Very impressive, Dan. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, right. I'm an architect. Um, started out life as a young architect <clears throat> straight out of a uh, professional degree and uh, then kind of uh, worked as an architect for a number of years and um, decided that computer graphics and, and compute, personal computing technology was really taking off but the rate of adoption was a little frustratingly slow for me. So naturally I went and did a graduate degree at UCLA and then launched that into a startup and um, seemed like the broadcast industry was a way to go and then sold that or IPO'd and sold it um, and then did the MBA program at UCLA, which got me to where I'm at right now, which is, you know, managing the business side, the business operations of um, high performing design firms is kind of my niche. So I've always been interested in technology just in general. I have all kinds of sensors and cool things in my house right now. Um, I, I taught at a local technical college for 12 years, which um, had an interesting snowball effect where I had this opportunity to write my first textbook. And uh, my first Revit book was copyright 2003. That turned out to be a good topic to write on. I now have the number one Revit book in North America. Um, and then 14 years into working on projects, uh, in an architectural office, uh, in a couple of them by that point, uh, design technology management position became available. And um, I didn't jump in at it right away at first, but interestingly enough, um, I decided that would be a place where I could do the most good in that firm. And then uh, now I teach, uh, going on seven years, graduate architecture students at NDSU, where we cover various things from BIM in general to analysis or energy modeling and some of the things that you mentioned in the opening comments um, i've presented internationally now with with that teaching and practice and um and book writing kind of under my belt i've had the opportunity to present in uh, singapore australia five six places in europe on on those same topics and then just interesting most recently at lake flato um, I also had the opportunity with our director of, of uh, design performance, Heather Holdridge, and four other people, we wrote the AIA Climate Action Guide for Practice, which is something that AI hired us to write and hopefully will be coming out in, in the coming months. 
Well, so what was the state of the firm at Lake Flato when each of you joined? I'm curious how it has evolved since. Yep, quite a bit. So I started, I'm thinking six years ago ish. And, uh, you know, like is super common for uh, a kind of a seller doer business model, right? The various architects, leaders are all wearing multiple hats and kind of trying to do zone coverage for all of the things that are not specifically architecture, like running the business, et cetera. Um, so I call it kind of mom and, mom and pop style of, of leadership and governance. And it was about 80 people. So at that point, you know, that's one of those threshold com business complexity uh, sizes where you kind of outgrown a mom and pop uh, style of governance. You got to kind of get a little bit more deliberate and sophisticated about it, which is why I was brought on. Um, it was basically, you know, to implement a kind of a stronger platform for the business to run on, to govern itself, such that it would enable um, a much faster rate of growth and ability to take on more complex projects in a broader geographical reach. And so we've um, done all that, right? We've got leaders that are dedicated in key positions like Dan in, in design technology, for example, Heather in sustainability, et cetera. There's a, a number of people they're really strong leaders in their in their functional silo, <clears throat> um, and it's enabled us to um, really grow nationally. So we got more than fifty percent of our work is now on the national stage, instead of being just regional to to Texas. Um, I'd say that the other thing that has changed a ton and has kind of fueled the the success more recently is. Um, going to an incentive compensation model where we've tied people's compensation to, directly to project performance in a couple of sophisticated ways. Um, and it's really kind of gotten everybody rowing in the right direction. And we've both improved our financial position as well as our um, quality of our buildings. So I actually started just a little over a year ago during the pandemic. Uh, one of the craziest things I ever did was switch jobs, sell a house, buy a house that I never saw in person and move across the country during a global pandemic. Uh, but I had interviewed just before the pandemic and um, thankfully the project load remained consistent and actually has, has grown during the pandemic. So um, as Scott mentioned, I was a strategic hire and so I filled a new position, worked on Scott, worked with Scott and a few others on a business plan that defined my role and the value it would bring to the firm. Um, so then, the, the, like I mentioned, there's continued growth during the pandemic, and we've rolled out many new tools and workflows that that are already taking shape and and uh, in a practical ways within the firm. I'm curious how you model out the oper like what the operational model is and how it might look um, if you were to take a snapshot or cut a section cut uh, through like Flato's operations and how that enables design at such a high quality at Lake Flato. Um, well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> you know, the uh, so there. So Lake Flato has uh, decades of, of success. It's not a new young firm at all. Um, so, you know, it comes with a very, very strong uh, design culture to begin with. It's been well curated and developed over many years. Um, and along with that, right, probably by virtue of where the, the original initial commissions were coming from, which would be Central Texas, climate is a huge concern. And so the idea of sustainability was embedded in the design process and the design thinking and the culture. I like Plato from the very first day, right? So the, the tricky part was, uh, you know, adding a little bit more deliberate deliberateness to the governance of that without losing like what was really working really well. And technology is the same deal. Um, you have to kind of slowly add those things to the existing process and design culture very slowly so that um, those kinds of tools get embraced well. 
So I think, you know, as a, as a broad overlay with all the operational silos, um, however you decide to divide that up and define each one of those. But the thing is that they're all pointed in the same direction, which is a support, a sense of supporting the design process. Um, and so it's not, it's not terribly complicated, right? And the idea is just to make sure that everybody knows what the predominant goal is and then what their role is in supporting that in some specific functional fashion. Yeah, and I, I would add to that that there's a balance between um, you know implementing tools now that the staff need, and then also looking to the future and and trying to experiment and, and bring in new things, um, and then also keeping the goal in mind of doing things to the benefit of our clients and the firm in terms of efficiency, accuracy, liability, profit profitability, um, and and maybe if you haven't heard of this, this will be a new book you can put on your list of something to read. But one one book that I really like to think about when I'm thinking about mapping out operations and and, and things like that is this book called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And it basically talks about coming up with this minimal viable product and getting it in front of the end user as soon as possible so that you're not working on things that nobody needs or wants or doesn't fit the culture in this case. So um, that balance of, of existing needs, just to get into a little bit de of detail, um, you know, I, I basically work closely with our studios and find out trying to keep tabs on what projects they're working on and what their needs are and, and then carefully assess tools and workflows and make sure they're accurate and create consistent, predictable results. And ideally tools that we can put into the hands of the design teams and not always have to depend on specialists so they can use it when they need it and, and repeat it uh, multiple times. So then that, of course, the implementation also has to be planned out so that it's, um, there's, there's good training and, and support to foster success. And then for future, um, needs we have in our office these different beams like focus groups and so we have this tech beam group that looks at future tech it might be you know things related to generative design or custom tools that we want to engage in um, and then like i mentioned it's culture is really important we want to make tools that uh, our staff want to use and and luckily we have a really great culture in the firm of people wanting to do sustainable design and uh, high performance design and use energy modeling tools and real-time rendering tools. Scott, you mentioned how uh, you've rolled out this new incentive structure um, that's really unlocked a new um, alignment with the team. I'm curious what other kinds of existing processes and new processes have really had a very strong impact um, on operations and the tech side at Lake Flato. Something um, that is particular to Lake Flay, it's not unique, it's very common across firms, I'm sure, but um, started out as a small firm. Um, and like I said, I would kind of describe it as a mom and pop style of, of governance early on, um, which has grown up. However, there's a DNA embedded in that where um, it's very comfortable um, and it's somewhat maybe might be described as easy to um, lead a smaller group. So if you're a firm and you're like 15 or 20 people, there's a certain amount of leadership and governance that comes with that, right? Um, so one of, one of the things that we did um, right when I arrived was in an effort to maintain that approach, um, divide the firm into studios, which are mostly correlated also with project types, as you might expect. Um, and but the point of the studios is that they're a little bit self-managing. So you have smaller groups of 10 to 20, maybe 25 people um, in a studio, and that enables the studio leadership to continue to govern um, in a in kind of an odd hat, ad hoc, informal approach, which is very popular and very comfortable for people. And then it's wrapped up into a, a larger umbrella leadership, which is then of course gonna be a little bit more complex and, and deliberate, um, but it makes it a lot easier for everybody. So it has enabled Lake Flato to grow from 
you know, the 60 people that it was when I started. And now we're at 140 or so, a little over that probably. Um, and but it, but it enabled that growth because otherwise, without dividing into the studios and without wrapping the incentive compensation program over the top of it, you know, none of those things would have happened. And, and we have access now to um, we have better, better, deeper bench depth, and it enables us to access more complex programmatic uh, projects that we wouldn't have been able to execute on before and uh, team up with other firms um, to make pretty compelling arguments for uh, winning proposals. I'm curious, uh, what, when when these different silos, um, like design tech, uh, people side design, in general, like tech infrastructure and the sustainable ability programs, when they're too siloed, I'm curious what patterns start to emerge when you, what do you start to see when it's not fully in sync? Yeah, that's a really great question. and. Um, I've been fortunate in the, most of the firms that I've worked at to have a really good relationship with IT. Uh, what I've seen in the industry and talking talking to people in forums and at conferences, um, some of the challenges that typically arise are the incompatibility of the hardware that's specced and purchased with the design tools, like the getting the right graphics card for a real-time rendering tool like Enscape is really important. It can make huge productivity and and just performance and impressions in front of clients. Um, so hardware and software, you know, potentially not being compatible. Um, also redundant tools, if there's um, purchasing of, of tools and, and not a careful analysis of which tool is right for the firm, or do we already have a tool that does 90 percent of that that same thing um, so having redundancy which then leads to challenges with support and and renewals and that person leaves who's spent a lot of time doing something in a really unique software um, you know being able to pick that up and have somebody else work with it um, so yeah I think that's those are the highlights probably probably a lot more to say on that Scott I know that there's there's a, uh, a story that you have about this, this shift that happened um, that you saw through or played a major part in at Lake Flitto shifting from one paradigm of design technology to a new paradigm. I'm curious what you maybe picked up uh, from in the earlier stages of this where you recognize there might be an, uh, something that we need to do here. Uh, well, I think uh, when uh, I, would, I would say I'd characterize the working habits at Lake Flato at the time of my arrival treating as treating technology generally as a um, little bit of a necessary evil or, or maybe a convenient, uh, a convenient way to produce documents that was, you know, in some way superior to drawing on paper. <clears throat> um, but that, you know, that's a far cry from leveraging the available technology and, and computing power to be more informative. Um, of the design process. And so, uh, you know, it was, it was a heavy lift and it remains for some folks, a heavy lift. And so we have, uh, we have many people who are tend to be further along in their careers that are very, uh, you know, analog oriented, you might say, perhaps, um, a lot of drawing, a lot of hand sketching. And it, you know, it actually is a very powerful juxtaposition between, doing things digitally uh, versus doing them by hand. And so there's a really, at this point, I'd say a very um, positive and productive uh, kind of relationship between um, both of those kinds of skill sets. And they're, and they're different skill sets, right? People who are, you know, what those of you know who read Randy Deutsch would say super users, but are able to leverage digital tools in very nimble fashion. Um, but then they're coupled up with people who are really, really good at um, expressing themselves and thinking uh, with pen on paper or pencil on paper. Um, so yeah, that's what we got at Lake Flato. It's actually pretty cool, but uh, it was the, adding the design technology part and getting people to embrace that um, and, and convince leadership that didn't 
have a lot of experience or a lot of successful experience with that in the past, that it just took the right kind of people and the right approaches and then you know, implementing stuff in a, a Lake Flato way or a, a way that supports the DNA of Lake Plato without diluting it and changing it into something that it doesn't want to be. Uh, I can add to that. But first, luckily, my entire library is at arm's reach. So here's here's the book Scott just mentioned. And Scott's actually quoted in this book. So this is this is a great book. I, I found a lot of value in that for me personally. And as I developed my career over the last few years, uh, but yeah, culture is is huge. I think also the fact that the firm has a, a relatively flat hierarchy, which doesn't work for a lot of, doesn't work for everyone. But um, given the culture, I, I think it works quite well. Um, there's there's a couple other things interesting to point out. Uh, the firm has annually this this outing, this weekend long outing, and it just occurred three weeks ago. I did it for the first time, where the entire firm and their partners and and children so this was 150 adults plus kids all all went to um, um, one of the founding partners ranch their ranch out in uh, texas here and we just had a fun weekend together there was no mini seminars on work related things it was just a a great outing and um, strategic messaging is also really interesting and i think worth pointing out um, a specific product that we use that I think is really great, the knowledge architecture synthesis tool, uh, where you have an app, people can have an app on their phone, it's the default page when you open your browser, just a really great way to, to get key information out to staff without having to blast, blast emails that um, uh, might get lost in, in amongst project work. Dan, it's interesting you brought up the uh, Lean Startup because, um, the, and this concept of the MVP, like, I'm curious, and, and then Scott, it, it's fascinating how you mentioned like the sketching, because in some sense, the sketching can be sort of like the MVP of an idea, architect, a schematic idea. But um, Dan, I imagine you have some thoughts on like how the MVP can be um, more effective in some cases, especially around like sustainability modeling um, with when, when you're actually doing something that's very tech enabled. Yeah, and to throw a total uh, curve into this idea, two of my 14 books are on hand drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a proponent of all tools, including the pencil, and 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 there are different phases at at, diff at uh, any given project where there's a, a, a variety of tools that come into play. Uh, but I have been a huge proponent of early energy modeling. So Lake Flato has been on the uh, 2030 commitment uh, pretty much since it started. So we've been reporting on our entire portfolio for 10 years. Um, we've won more of the AIA Coat Awards than any other firm in the U.S. Um, and I've, I've done a bunch of presentations to different AIA Coat working groups. So if anybody's out there and interested in one, I've done one recently for Philly and, and – uh, New Orleans, and then just recently a three-hour workshop for our own AA San Antonio group. And um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of doing that early energy modeling, which as the, the AIA 2030 uh, report by the numbers, an annual report comes out and, and shows statistically that doing early energy modeling produces better results consistently, which kind of makes sense, but it's good to see that data back in a, backing that up. How about what happened uh, last year when everything had to move to remote? I'm curious what kinds of experiments you ran, Scott and, and Dan, um, just and what played out well? What, what are you going to carry into uh, moving to hybrid? How To what degree are you moving hybrid? Just love to hear more thoughts on that transition. So it's actually a super timely question. Um, one of the things that we did, uh, although I didn't know that there was about to be a pandemic uh, about to occur, I wish I had known, but I didn't, um, but we had moved to a, a technology deployment model, which is VM-based, so everybody's you know, got a slice of a um, virtual server somewhere, um, and then you know, what they have physically in front of them is a, is a tablet, and so every, we, we standardized that uh, deployment form factor, if you will, 
Um, we did it to enable people to travel more easily um, and move between our two offices more easily. In other words, you know, it's the same experience no matter where you are. You just dock your, your tablet docks and uh, all the computing is done through a VM solution. Well, what that enabled us to do is, is pivot, uh, you know, across 48 hours of a weekend to be entirely remote. And we just needed to get more gear uh, to people's home offices was the, the bigger challenge. Um, so it, we were incredibly fortunate that we had made that choice um, to start deploying technology in that way. Um, so it was really easy for us to switch to fully remote working. Secondly, um, we decided that since nobody's in the office anyway, and our San Antonio office was long overdue for a, a, a renovation, really, it was very old school planning from 30 years ago. So we are doing a, a significant renovation of the office right now. And we're in the redesign. Um, it's very hoteling centric, uh, very uh, with far fewer actual traditional desks per head than we've ever had before. So they would be oversubscribed. And so we've got, you know, it's going to be a hoteling model. It's going to be hybrid. People are going to be part-time remote at home, traveling part-time in the office, either office. Um, but they're also physically in the design. There are all kinds of ancillary flexible use spaces, right? So the expectation is that um, teams and people wouldn't necessarily just sit at desks. They have a lot of different sort of options about how to work. Um, so that's going to be a really big experiment for us. So the technology deployment has been e extremely successful. Um, and then we'll see how our new physical space works out. Yeah, and I, I can add to that as well. Um, really, our our design staff now have the best of both worlds. They have this Microsoft Surface type thing in front of them. It's it's the Dell version of that. But this this enables them to have a an active stylist to do markups in Bluebeam or, or even use Microsoft Edge to open a contract or, or something and, and sign it and save it as a PDF. Um, and then they're connecting to a high powered computer in the office, like Scott alluded to, where they have a really high end graphics card that can open uh, some of our biggest projects in, in Enscape, for example, and, and and have the horsepower to, to move around and, and give the best a possible presentation and uh, one really cool thing about all of this and how it worked out is is uh, Dell featured this uh, initiative that we did on a blog post where they interviewed me on their website uh, several months ago I got some questions coming in about um, recruiting bringing in talent we've had actually some previous conversations today too about that uh, I'd love to know what breakthroughs have you made in your approach to attracting, developing, and retaining talent? Well, retention's good. Who wants to leave during a pandemic? <laughs> that isn't our doing. <laughs> but no, so we have we you know we enjoy a very strong reputation in the marketplace for for staff for talent. Um, so for the most part, you know, I'd say that um, people are coming to us, which is great. It's an incredible luxury to have that. Um, and we also know that the people that are coming to us are, are the, the sorts of people that, um, you know, our, our style of work, our approach to work resonates with them in the first place. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be coming to us. <clears throat> um, so, you know, our challenges are not so much in the uh, retention and developing and attracting uh, talent. That kind of comes with the territory. Our challenge is really a, a challenge of geography. You know, to be honest, San Antonio and, and to a degree Austin, they're just not super talent dense um, environments. Like um, I come from Seattle before, um, professional uh, culture of Seattle and uh, same with Los Angeles. And, you know, you can't throw a rock without hitting a bunch of really talented folks. And everybody's competing for all those people. So our challenge really is in um, getting people to move to San Antonio predominantly. So the breakthrough piece is remote work, right? To so the degree that we're going to be able to leverage successfully um, genuine remote work uh, kind of opens up the platform for us on a national level to um, 
you know, hire in a, a different, slightly different fashion, meaning that we don't have to convince people that San Antonio is so amazing that they have to, you know, they couldn't live without moving here. Um, yeah. So we're experimenting with that a little bit, right? We got, now we have a handful of people who are, you know, 100% uh, remote and will remain so, right? They're not anywhere close to either of the offices. So we'll see how that works out. Yeah, and I can add to that too, being relatively new myself, uh, there are some great programs internally in terms of mentorship. Um, I, I know we also have three people that uh, basically foster the development of the interns to make sure that they know what's going on and, and are able to get involved in, in various things. Um, there's a, 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 an orientation that is incredibly thorough and that whole synthesis uh, website, web-based platform uh, is just laid out in a really great way to get access to everything from um, uh, HR and policy information to benchmarks for different types of projects, you know, EUI benchmarks to technology and to, to COVID information. So having that information, plus myself and one of our building performance uh, folks, we do an orientation for every new employee that's an hour long about our various design performance and design technology initiatives and what's available to them and, and, and just try and impress upon them. There's resources available to them and, and also wow them a little bit with some of the cool stuff we're doing. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the working culture at Lake Flato. You mentioned a flat structure, you mentioned studios, you mentioned this new um, office environment that's currently a new experiment. Um, just would love to hear some more ideas because I know that you play up a lot of parts of that. So it's not only is it amazing design work, but also an amazing working culture. I'd just love to hear a little bit more of the details of that. Uh, yeah, um, right. So passion for uh, design and uh, passion for high performing buildings and uh, sensitivity to context and environment kind of comes comes with the territory. Um, so everybody that's going to be at Lake Plato shares those kind of values. Um, but what you know wouldn't necessarily be totally readily apparent from the outside is that it's also got a very strong sense of the benefit of having a healthy uh, balance of you know, work, professional work with um, other stuff, what, whatever that is, right? Uh, family passions for different kinds of, uh, you know, activities that are outside of the office. Like Dan just mentioned, we do have an annual retreat where, you know, as many people from the firm as can. Um, this was a year, weird, weird year, but typically, you know, the bulk of the firm plus their family uh, goes out to one of the founding partners, big giant ranch and West Texas. Um, and so all of that, those, uh, that kind of ethos is embedded in, in the working culture. Um, so yeah, I'd say we have a pretty, pretty healthy balance that is really attractive to people once they start working at Lake Plato, and kind of get, start to get a sense of the whole picture. Dan, how about the design teams um, with like the general approach to testing out, exploring design technology uh, what is, what is, I know that there is a kind of paradigm shift that happened at Lake Flato, um, but just curious if we were to, what, what is the other people in your team? I'm sort of curious about them, uh, like the, the mindset about design tech. Sure. Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'm the director of design technology. We also have a BIM manager and he has a really interesting background as well, just the highlights really is uh, he he worked at Revit before the Autodesk acquisition where, where Autodesk bought Revit and then worked at Autodesk, I think, for 17 years after that. So um, he's he's an amazing resource. Uh, we, we work amazingly well together and have lots of ideas and the challenge is finding the, the time to do it. This, this summer, we actually hired an intern, an architecture student from UTSA. So... San Antonio uh, University of Texas and um, 
and have been working on some really interesting initiatives. Our design performance group, I already mentioned Heather Holdridge is the director of that group. And we have an intern uh, that has a year long internship uh, working with us from uh, Houston and then another uh, design uh, sustainable design coordinator that works directly with all the projects to make sure they're staying on track for their goals and and documenting all this and which really helps when we get to our annual uh, AIA 2030 reporting, having all our ducks in a row instead of uh, trying to scramble at the last minute to, to do all of this. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, there's some specialized groups of people, but again, like I mentioned earlier, one of my big goals is to try and um, for for things that should be done early and and more often. Uh, it's it's better to get those tools and training in the hands of the teams that need it. And we still have specialists that that can do more complicated things as needed, or even just if, if the team doesn't have time for it, we want to make sure it still gets done. Uh, early energy modeling, daylighting analysis, embodied carbon uh, analysis, uh, things like that. Both of you have, as we mentioned in the beginning, these kind of combined um backgrounds in a sense like uh the foundation is architecture but then it's you found this like specialty inside i'm just curious um what what lessons do you feel are are between the two of those uh that maybe someone who is a fully generalist architect might be missing um i'd love just to hear from each of you like a, a key lesson from your dis sort of like secondary discipline um and how that could maybe be passed on to either emerging leaders or maybe younger firms that are working through challenges? I'd say at some point I uh, recognized that in order to really excel at something uh, relative to other people, like in, in the in the sense of being the best, um, you kind of have to focus on what you really, really like doing. And so I thought I really liked designing buildings. Um, and I do. But uh, right, I like running the business even a lot more, um, and so it's you can. I just don't think that unless you truly, really love the thing that you're doing, that you can really, you know, match all the potential that you have. So stick with what you love. Yeah, you know, there's a old saying about not letting yourself get pigeonholed into something, which, in some respects, is true. But then on the other hand, if you really do like something. You, you can become really good at it. And, and another bit of advice too is don't wait until you're an expert really to put yourself out there and, and get involved and try, try and be part of the change that is needed in our industry, in our world to solve the big problems that we've, we're facing. Um, you know, and the whole idea of who's an expert is, is pretty subjective. There's, there's always somebody smarter, smarter than, than the expert, right? So... That's, that's my my thoughts. Uh, Dan, uh, it's been a really fun conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us here at Section Cut. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks.